All right. Well, welcome all of you to the uh, the September edition of the Cincinnati Ruby Brigade. Um, we're going to talk about something that's pretty interesting for, at least for me, um, if you don't think it's interesting, well, that's just too bad. Um, I have over time gotten really, um, really into this idea of like the a second brain um, and runnable code that has like markdown and stuff next to it. Um, I recently went through a an MBA program. One of my classes was on, uh, there was something about economics with it. So there were supply and demand curves and things that needed to be, to be charted and calculations that needed to be made around that. And um, in order to learn some of the material, I actually ended up building some live book things, which is the Elixir version of a, of a, a code notebook and graphing those things in line with the uh, the calculations and some markdown and some some math notation. Uh, and it, it was just really helpful for me. Like it helped me to understand the the material and I, I got to save that off and kind of clone it and, and work with it different ways. And, and that was fun. Um, today specifically, uh, I want to kind of talk about one way that you can use these code notebooks, like this kind of concept and one of the implementations of it to build like a recipe book, something that's versionable, that's shareable with your team that may replace some of the other ways that you do things um, that are maybe more ad hoc or one-off or rely on a, a higher amount of domain context or, or tech stack context than, than this. Um, so this is hopefully gonna be fairly collaborative. Um, these notebooks are intended to be collaborative. So it's kind of a little bit meta, but um, uh, I made the presentation editable for today and we're gonna just go through it together and it is itself a notebook. Oh, so a little bit of dog fooding here. Um, so I guess there's an initial question here of what do you do on a regular basis uh, in, in like a Rails console that um, you know that you have to do, you know how to do it, it's a pretty one-off thing. And you find yourself essentially typing the same thing over and over a lot. Um, I have an example here, but I'm, I'm not looking to like, it's not like this is the right answer. So please tell me it's adding a role to a user. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious, like what, what kind of tasks do you find yourself doing that require you to boot up the, the console and like type things in manually that you find to be kind of repetitive? Uh, yeah, I, for example, go, go, ahead, go, go ahead, Bill, sorry. All right. I was just going to say, aside from the obvious example you have here, <laughs> we're always, you know, like with the app that we're cloning, um, the, uh, staging data off of to run locally, we have to go and reset our password or whatever, um, on user accounts or, uh, the other thing we're doing constantly is running jobs. Um, mm, yep. Do, yep. Doing jobs or, um, filtering a job queue for specific jobs that we want to kill because we've changed the code for that job or whatever. Um, and I thought there was a third example, but I'll kick it over to Ula. He may be a better one. Go for it, Ula. Sorry, sorry. I was trying to switch. Uh, I, I, I um, sometimes on um, check, uh, sometimes a client asks, can you change, for example, tags uh, for these users, or can you add those uh, tags or that? And I uh, like just try uh, some uh, functions, but most frequently I do uh, like checking statuses or uh, subscription uh, um, data, or for example, make a, a call to Stripe uh, to retrieve um, um, some customer data. Or uh, another pretty often thing I do is um, pulling a project, a customer's project, and looking at the properties. And um, then because it's a complex one, uh, it's, it has a graphics object, which is a very complex one. And I, before doing it in production console, uh, I work out uh, in that in the local console uh, the way I would have to change, uh, for example, font size or color, etc. Mm. Those are the most frequent ones for me. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, Uh, 
Okay. Uh, anybody else? Doesn't have to be with Ruby for what it's worth. Like Andrew, I, I don't know if you had anything on on your project in Elixir that you would have to do regularly, kind of in the generic or the abstract sense. Um, I was trying to think. Like I said, I mostly use it for like sending lines for my tests over to hmm, yeah, con yeah, match it up in development. There's also just like one-off data fix kind of stuff, but that's <clears throat> something that's generally one-off, not that you would want to store and hang around. Yeah, so um, you might do something like factory bot dot create user. And <laughs> uh, then do like, yeah, stuff like that. That, that's interesting. Um, anything else? Um, similarly, just like creating data in a particular, like in a particular state for a particular view, um, especially if you can't do that, um, like through the UI very easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, I know, for instance, on COA, like making a uh... Uh, making a user that had a bunch of appointments and like a schedule and all this stuff, it was way easier to just, you know, we have those scenarios created all over in the tests. We, I would just do that instead of through the UI. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, curious, is there any other, uh, like, how do you, when you're doing those things, how do you remember them? <laughs> Like, how do you remember what's that one command that I do to kick off that job? Or um, what's the role called for that user? Um, or how do I share this with somebody else? Like, what are, the, what are the ways that you have in the past when you found something to be useful that you had to run manually in the console? Have you shared that with other people or shared it with your future self? <laughs> yeah, I keep a I, I, kind of directory structure of notes for particular client or project or whatever. Um, I keep marked down notes, but they're not, you know, of course, executable. I just have to, you know, copy the code out of the the note and then paste that into a repo or whatever, run it. And then if someone wants to use it, I usually just have to say, here, this section of code is formatted as, or text is formatted as code in, you know, Discord channel or whatever. And, run this code um, and you'll be fine. So, but again, it's, they're my notes. I don't have them in a repo anywhere. They're not searchable. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, actually Katarina and I were doing that this, this morning a bit, um, which is kind of like another way this is useful for setting up test data. Um, you know, take a bunch of complex methods and rip the guts out of those methods and kind of inline them and say, here's actually what's happening is this, um, you know, issue is manifesting itself. And we can see at this very level, various stages, what the data is. And then, um, uh, so yeah, test set up, I guess maybe it's already covered, but that's a frequent. Okay. Um, Andrew, were you going to say something? Uh, I don't remember. I'm pretty firmly in champ number one there. I just lean on my autocomplete and <laughs> histories and stuff. Yes, um, same, same for me. I, uh, I, I don't know any way of storing it. Uh, I just uh, Sometimes I forget the names of properties, go back to schema, and then retype everything by, uh, from scratch. Sure. <laughs> There's one other way that almost every project uses, every team uses, um, but I'm curious, anybody else have any other? Do you have any other useful ways that you store off these kinds of things that help pin, you in the future? Pin them in Discord. Pin them in Discord. <laughs> I love it. Posted notes. I'm just kidding. But it's kind of <laughs> true in a way when right? you get so deep into what you're doing, you just kind of jot something uh -huh. down quickly. Katarina, I didn't know that you were in here. I, I, my, list, my list ended before. Before I, I sneaked in later <laughs> on. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the other one, thing, one thing yeah. I'll add, sorry, real quick, is um, if it's something that can be shared without um, revealing any, you know, uh, client uh, information or whatever, proprietary information, mm -hmm. um, I'll put it in a, a GitHub gist so it's a little more accessible, but not always. Yep. Uh, so the way that I think I've also seen it done personally is add it to the readme. There's a lot of those like, here's how to set up your user for the first time kinds of things. And they're almost always like marked down with like a Ruby syntax um, escape, kind of like up here, um, which is like copy and paste and you grab it and you put it in your Rails console. And the instructions are almost always like run bin Rails console and then paste this in and then change the password as needed and things like that. Um, so it's really interesting, but they, they end up in the readme pretty often as a part of the markdown file. All right, anybody else? I'm really looking for life hacks here. So I'm not like trying to flesh out this list. I'm really trying to figure out if anybody does it better than I do. <laughs> I love that we're all kind of in the, gosh, I hope it stays in my history and I'll never get a new laptop. <laughs> Sometimes we or do that like my them. history transfers. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> Sometimes we do like um like almost like a Minecraft or quad graph. I don't know what it's called, but like just um like the tools that you can graph it or say this happens and then arrow, this happens and this happens. A flow chart maybe. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> what it's like a, almost like say. a decision tree, like if you run this yeah. and it succeeds, go to this step. Yeah. Okay, those are those are really good. Um, so some of this kind of mirrors some of the the other ways that we work. Um, Bill, you said you kind of have like folders with markdown notes and things like that. Um, I I tend to use that for almost all of my uh, non technical non code kinds of things. I have like a pretty pretty large and growing Obsidian um, second brain, if you want to call it that, where you document notes for meetings that you had with people or um, ideas that came out of something or like, you know, for me, it would, it would have been for like the MBA classes I was in um, documenting concepts and how they related to each other across different classes and stuff like that. Um, so they're really helpful. If you are, if you're just kind of like new to the idea of doing that, there's some pretty good documentation in, in, in books and stuff around it. I just linked to one, one, one site. Um, but really, I would just recommend probably that you go talk to Peter Cannon and, and ask him what he thinks about it. And, and you'll hear as much as you need to hear about uh, moving forward with, with something. Um, I've gone through a couple of different tools um, and landed mostly on Obsidian. It's it's free. It's fairly standard and easy to get going. Um, making links, it's just Markdown. Um, and it supports lots of good stuff like math notation kind of built in, um, stuff like that. So that helps me for the non-coding side. When it comes to code, I actually kind of backed my way into Jupyter um, because Elixir uh, started up a project called Livebook. And Livebook is pretty sweet. Um, if you haven't experienced it yet, I would encourage you to do that. It has a lot of built-in support for things like just dropping down and adding like a neural network task, image classification, or audio transcripts, or things like that. It can kind of do that pretty well, almost out of the box. Um, it's actually much easier to do that stuff with Livebook to get started with like some of the machine learning stuff that I've been looking into versus trying to use Jupyter notebooks and stuff. They almost always seem to be out of date and like dependencies aren't there and stuff. Um, so it's a, it's a really good introduction, almost more gentle introduction to some of the neural network machine learning things that you can do, but also supports math notation and markdown and, and Elixir code charting and visualization, stuff like that. Um, Jupyter is, Sort of like the second thing that I jumped into though, because I was like, okay, how do I do this with Ruby? And the answers were less clear. <laughs> uh, but Jupyter added the capability a number of years ago for um, different kernels to run. So Jupyter is, if you look at the spelling of it, you can probably tell it's, it's Python-centric. Um, so a lot of data science notebooks and things like that, that you'll see where people are like, here's a new model that you can do to do this specific task. You'll see the, the Jupyter notebook link for those things. And they'll oftentimes, 
host them somewhere that you just click on it and it'll spin up an entire environment that can run those dependencies and everything. Um, so it's a really useful way of like saying, here's some reproduce, here's some reproducible data and execution of that of tasks around that data, but also being able to like annotate it and and mark it down with thoughts and um, some of the research notes and things like that. Um, so it's it kind of grew out of that. Um, but they added the ability to do other kernels, and then somebody created an iRuby kernel for it and lets you run Ruby code within the Jupyter Notebook um, as, as the back end for, for the code that you write. So it's pretty cool. Um, it works fairly well. It lets you do that whole like hybrid code and documentation where you can say, here's some code, execute that. What you should see is this, because you can persist the outputs and actually save those and check those into uh, code repo so people see what they should be seeing when they when they execute it, as well as like what they actually did and they can make their own uh, determinations of whether something worked or didn't and that kind of thing. Um, it lets you write and execute that code in line and document it um, in a way that's a little bit more persistent than just the history of your console or um, putting it in a readme. The readme is very similar, except you just can't click run on the readme, right? Um, so this is kind of like an executable readme, um, but you can use it for lots of different tasks. Um, it's better than a GitHub gist because you can check it into your project right alongside the other things. And um, you can even prompt for user input on some of that stuff. And so if there's like a sensitive password or something, you can leave that part out, prompt for it, and then um, execute the code without checking in sensitive information. Um, you can also check, you can also persist, choose not to persist the outputs. So if there's like sensitive information that you don't want to have in the repo, you can do that as well. Um, and it kind of beats some of the other things here too. Like Slack and Discord is great, but then you have to go find it in this other repository of information that doesn't live alongside the code that you're trying to uh, to document as you go. So I found Jupyter Notebooks and live books and things like that to be really helpful um, just for exploring things, for running repetitive tasks, for documenting it for other people, and for just making like personal notes on on information. So it's, it's a pretty cool way to go. Um, and also let you like visualize some of the outputs that you're, you're looking for. Uh, I mentioned the other notebooks there. Uh, so let's just get into some demo stuff real quick. Uh, I'm gonna show kind of what I, it's like a simulation of what I would consider like the most obvious entry point for, for anybody doing a Jupyter notebook, which is like setting up a user and adding a role. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of where I got there. Um, if you're looking to follow along uh, there, I put a link in the, um, in the general channel of the Cincinnati Ruby Brigade Discord that links to the notebook, but that is on the branch of a uh, project that we actually looked at before for transitioning job processing over to good job. So we, I just left all that other stuff in there because there's actually some tables and things that we can use. Um, and I added a bogus user and roles table along with the user role mapping table just to help us kind of demonstrate a little bit of that stuff. So if you're, if you want to follow along and execute some of these things you can. Uh, the first thing is getting it up and running. Um, the great thing is VS Code is probably, as far as I'm concerned, VS Code is like the best environment to get up and running with Jupyter and Ruby. Um, if you're already using something like ASDF, it can actually detect that you have that, that Ruby kernel installed and it can automatically prompt you to do all the things that you need to do. So if you go to the extensions in VS Code and you just search for Jupyter, minding that you have to type in a Y for the for the I part of it. Um, you will see this top level Jupyter. If you install that, oh, reload the course. If you install that, it'll bring in a whole bunch of other things. Um, key mapping, cell tags, uh, rendering stuff, uh, just some other helpful things that are all part of that bundle. So you'll end up installing a number of things. And when you get back to the point of Jupyter being installed, what you can then do is do if you're on a Mac, uh, it's Command Shift B. If you're on a Windows machine, I think it's Control Shift B. And you can do just type in Jupyter, and you'll see Create New Jupyter Notebook. And you click on that, and you can see that the default kernel environment is Python. Um, if you click on that, you can change that to anything else that you have uh, that you have around. And so you can do that. You can also change the the kernel up here. Um, assuming that you have something installed, it'll show up there. Uh, it'll probably the first time give you some errors and tell you that you need some other extensions. And generally speaking, what I found doing this a couple of times is if you just kind of click through the, yeah, do the thing for me, 
uh, you end up in a place where you can actually execute Ruby code. And then what you end up with here is just a, uh, well, if you don't have Copilot, you end up with a nicer experience because you don't end up getting bombarded by Copilot trying to help. <laughs> Stop it. Um, but you can do things like um, just regular Ruby code. So that's, that's the basics of it. Um, and for the most part, like anything you would expect to work here generally does. Like if you call file.open, that was the thing I was going to do right before this. But if you call file.open on a PNG file, then it will display the PNG file as part of the output for the next, for that cell. Um, so there's some really useful just built in things for it. You can also run, you can also write markdown. So you can say things like this is an H1. And it will do that. Uh, you'll also get an outline if you show that uh, off to the side, which is kind of helpful when you're trying to show things. Um, H2, H3, another H2. So there's just like some basic stuff. You can kind of see how it broke that out into collapsible outline. Um, so if you're trying to document things with like an information hierarchy that's sort of built into it, you can do that. and. Um, you can interleave code in between these these cells, right? So you can just add another code cell. You can add another markdown cell, and then maybe maybe the, the rest of that markdown belongs there. And you want to write some code here. You can do that, and and your your outline basically stays intact for the hierarchy that you want to do. And then as you execute these cells, if they're markdown cells, they just get replaced with um, with the markdown HTML that's generated. If they're code cells, it will execute them and then show you what the evaluation was right next to it. And you can persist that, you can save it, and then you can check it in. People will see all of your annotated code just like that. So pretty neat, pretty useful. Um, let's get into that specific example. Uh, any, any questions before we get that far? Uh Tim, uh, can can you uh, may, uh, sorry if you uh, answer that question? Not uh, how do you per, uh, save this? Uh, how, how do you save it? it how, how, yeah, how do you save it? Uh, ah. And how is it? How easy it is to find it after that? And yeah. uh, like, um, uh, would it would it live in uh, like one uh, uh, project repo, or would you be able to ah. reach it from any other project? It's Thank however you. you want to do it. You could save it in a gist if you want. If it's specific to your application, then just save it in. I usually create a little top level notebooks folder. Um, one of the cool things, I'm glad that you asked that because I was going to forget. <laughs> one of the cool things that you can do with it is if, because it, uh, because GitHub has sort of a semantic understanding of these notebooks, when you check it into uh, a repo, then it, it will actually render, it'll render that thing that you, you gave it. So like the create new role, it'll actually show you the output that was persisted as well. So you can save that version it, check it in to your repo, just like any other file, it shows up as an IPYNB. So um, I think it used to be called IPython notebooks or something like that um, before they renamed it to Jupyter. So um, that extension looks a little bit weird, but when you check it in, GitHub actually has a pretty good understanding of how to render those things. It's pretty cool. But yeah, I, I, I would normally check it into the project that I'm on unless it was something that's like, how do I do this in the general case across projects? And then I would try to find a different repo or, Put it in the gist or something like that. I'm assuming it can render the gist the same way too. If you give Thank it you. Right so, that, mm -hmm. so it means that it works just like a README file, right? Where, where, yeah. To whichever yeah. repo you add it, it will exist. Thank you. Yep. And I think you can probably just link to it from the main README if you wanted to and say, like, mm -hmm. here's, here's where to go. Um, if you're just expecting people to mostly read it. But the real value in these things tends to be being able to just load it up in your VS code or whatever and, and execute it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the most obvious early questions then is like, okay, cool. I have this Ruby kernel running. I'm inside of a Rails application 90% of the time. How do I make sure that the code from my Rails application is available to my notebook? Um, there's a number of different ways to do it. I think that I've seen uh, this one is the easiest one that I found. Um, you just require the files and then call require environment. So when you run that, it should run true. If it's done it the first time, false every time after that, just because that's how require tends to work. Um, it'll say false if, you, um, if you've if you already loaded it. And then you've got your Rails environment and everything that you have in that environment is available to you. So you can do things like user.all and you'll get what you would expect to see if you were in IRB. Um, there are ways to visualize that uh, that are pretty nice. 
so you, you don't necessarily have to see it this way. I'll kind of go through some of that here in, in a little bit, but um, you're not stuck with just exactly what you would get in the console. You can actually visualize the data a little bit better and even get tables that can be sorted and stuff, I think. So, um, so let's go through that really obvious example and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll show you kind of why some of the code here is written the way that it is. Um, and it'll hopefully kind of ring a bell for, for some of the other things you've done in Rails applications. Um, the easiest thing to do if you're trying to ch make changeable data, obviously, is just assign it to a variable and then run the same code. So you can do that. I, in, in Elixir live books, you can do a, what's called Kino inputs that basically put little text fields up on the screen that you have to answer before you can execute past that. I didn't get far enough in these to figure out if that's the case because I, I wouldn't really normally use that. But sometimes that's a better prompt, like a little form that you fill out at the top um, to make all the parameters for, for a notebook work the way you want them to. Um, but what you'll see here is that I've got it looking up the user first, and if it can't find it, then it creates it with the password that you gave. Um, the reason for that is similar to the reason why you would like, uh, why you would normally write item potent seed files um, so that you can run this thing over and over and over again. And it's not trying to recreate the same user over and over again, because you might want to come in here and only execute one of these cells further down, but you need the context from above it. Um, so I usually, when I'm writing these kinds of like recipe style, uh, recipe style notebooks, I usually t tend to write them item potent so that they only do a thing once. And if you run them multiple times after that, they won't redo the same thing again. They'll just look up the information. Um, so that's kind of handy if you run into these things with notebooks, um, just to make it a little bit easier on yourself. <laughs> uh, and then the obvious thing, right? Adding somebody to the role and it's similar, right? You're looking up the role or creating it if it doesn't exist. You may not want to do that, but I did here. And then um, assigning that role unless it's already included in that that user's roles. So yeah. And then uh, if you want to like verify that it worked, you can say user dot find. Uh, well, I've already got user, right? So I can say user dot roles and just spit that out. And you get this collection proxy where admin is in there. Um, so it's useful for, for that kind of normal stuff. You can save this then at that point. So if this is the first time you're doing it, you're like, okay, what are the steps I need to do? You can outline it and mark down and then put code blocks in and then you can put that in there. It takes a little bit more time. And then you have something that's documented that you can check in and then somebody else says, hey, how do I add that, that role that you were talking about the other day? You could just point them to that file and let them execute it when they pull down the latest version of it instead of, instead of copying and pasting something from your Rails console history into some Discord chat that goes away um, because it scrolls past and you forget about it from the moment. It's also a, a little bit more secure way of sharing things, especially if it's a private repo, but I'm not I'm not advocating that you share private information that way either. So. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. I, I guess my question for everybody is like, is this have you encountered this before or is this new? How many people is this new for? Like this whole the whole idea of like these notebooks and everything. Is this the first time you've encountered them or have you done them before? Eli, I saw you raise your hand. Which one were you raising your hand for? Uh, it's, really it's, it's new. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think you were saying uh, if it is new to you and that's why I raised. I heard of them, but it's new to use them. Okay. I what's use these your, all the what's time your for impression oh. so far. Sorry. Alex, I don't I don't want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> what do you use them all the what do you use them? I use I use them all the time for like Python stuff, but I never even knew you could do it with Ruby. And I never you could knew you could tie it to like your local yeah. data as well uh, from a configuration well, file. Like, That's pretty cool. Could you get a similar experience in Livebook if you just dropped down and ran like system.command do this stuff. I know it's not going to be quite as nice, but I'm just curious if it's possible. Um, are you asking if you can do system commands in this, or are you asking if you can get access to like a Phoenix application from Livebook? The second one, essentially, if you could, well, uh, also like Ruby and Rails in Livebook, if you could just run like system.command IRB and then drop down and do this stuff. Oh, uh, that's a good question. These are generally not like, you don't usually get like an interactive prompt inside of these. So if you ran like a system command that dropped you into a console, I'm not sure how that would work. We could try that maybe later. Um, 
to the question of like using Livebook to connect to and talk to Phoenix applications, um, because Elixir has the distributed thing kind of down pretty well, <laughs> um, all you have to do is get the shared cookie and give them each a short name. And then it'll actually usually pre-populate in the list. You can say collect, connect to remote node and it will give you that already listed and you just click on it and then you're inside, you're running Phoenix application. So you don't have to do the required environment. You're just, you're just in it, um, which works pretty well. You can get access to your repo and make queries and stuff like that. Because I really like using these as like a, essentially a REPL that you can like save state in my head. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, now I'm going to keep this now. A primary use case for me is essentially like a persistent annotated REPL. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I it, I would be curious to like try running the server and everything, just have like a development notebook. All right, let's uh let's move on. Unless there's anybody else have anything for that? Like yeah, I might have missed it. Could you go over the um how to set up Ruby um for your Jupyter notebook? Yeah, so if you have installed the Jupyter extension, there is this thing at the top. So as soon as you create a new Jupyter notebook, what will typically be the case is you'll see, like, it'll want you to install Python. Oh, I guess I'm getting Python now. <laughs> it'll There you go. It'll want you to install Python and by default give you, like, either a list or a recommended Python version. There is a Jupyter kernel. There should be a Jupyter kernel selection there. If you have um, if you have installed Ruby, then you should get something in here that's like here's a Ruby kernel that you can pick. I've seen this screen show up like four different ways, and I can't honestly tell you like I, it was easy in the sense that like it showed me the things and said, hey, but if you want to use this Ruby kernel, you need iRuby. Would you like me to install it? You click yes, it runs like Jim install iRuby or whatever that is, and then. Like all that stuff just kind of works, but um, I, I didn't I didn't record myself doing it, even though I did it yesterday. Um, I just wanted to make sure that nobody was going to have like major trouble if they kind of went the the middle road. So, um, but yeah, usually there's this little thing up here that says Python. You pick um, you pick what kernel you want. You pick a Jupyter kernel, and then Ruby should show up in there. I don't know if there's any other kernels. Um, there might be, but at the, when they when they announced multiple kernel support. The big one that I saw was that they all they also released iRuby along with iPython. They have TypeScript. Oh, I mean JavaScript. Uh, you know what's funny is snark, snark, if snark. I run <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is an interesting thing that I found when I ran this before. Um, if you if you open up the other notebook, right? So if I gosh, I closed the tab that had that. Um if I open up one of the Ruby notebooks where it's actually executing Ruby code, it, and I had a require at the top, it actually said like something about JavaScript require package.com or something. It was a JavaScript error. It wasn't like a, a Ruby one. So it was kind of interesting, but it, it'll run Ruby code, right? So if I create a, even in the, even in the browser notebook version of this, uh, it'll run the Ruby code as well, um, which I might get to at the end if we, if we have time. But. Alex, did that answer your question well enough? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, okay, so that's the demo of the basic admin. Um, one of the other key things that I use it for personally is when I'm trying to answer a question with data, um, this is a pretty standard thing I've encountered throughout my career where somebody asks a question, there is a clear need for going and gathering the information doing some kind of transformation and internalization analysis of it, and then sharing the results of that in a way that other people trust. And what tends to happen is all of that, except for the very last part. So like everybody goes to the data, asks the questions, comes to their own conclusions, which is, that's good, right? Like having independent thought and different perspectives is a good idea. But then when you come back together to say, okay, this is what we all agree on about it's the situation, what do we need to do about it? Then there's no agreement actually on, uh, on the data because everybody goes back and, you know, you're sharing like Excel spreadsheets or whatever. And people are like, well, I have my Excel spreadsheet and it looks like this. Where did you get your data? And people are just comparing tabs and formulas for the rest of their lives. Um, that That's not fun. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's kind of fun, but it's not really all that fun. Um, so what I like to do whenever I notice that there's a question that needs to be answered is I tend to try to go find a way that's reproducible to be able to share what I found 
so that we can all agree on like, yes, this is the data, these transformations happened. This is the result of that. So let's make a decision on that after we trust it. Um, that's hard to do. It's actually really hard to do. <laughs> um, so this is one of the tools that I use for it. I'm curious kind of as like a general poll, like what do you do right now when you're asked a question, like a technical question that has specific data that you need to gather and analyze before you answer it? Like, how do you do that? Um, I seeded it a little bit. We have we have MetaBase, so we have the ability to ask SQL questions or um, this MetaBase DSL questions that save as reproducible queries, and then we can share those things and other people can look at them. So that's one way that I like to do it. Um, pretty low bar, but like, what do you do when when you encounter this problem? Like, how do you go about it? Do you encounter it? Am I just making up this scenario? <laughs> no, I yeah. I certainly encounter it. And Katarina, were you going to speak? Go ahead. I'll let you give your perspective from the client's side. I was just going to say just explored like a spreadsheet. But again, that's kind of mm -hmm. just not yeah. a very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was going to say, you know, oftentimes you have to lean on our project manager who's kind of good sitting the fence between the two comes from the SQL background mm -hmm. and you know interfacing with the product owner or stakeholders and us trying to point him to a line of code which is hopefully succinct, succinct enough where they can say yeah these values represent this calculation but where did that value in that calculation come from and then going down a rabbit hole and trying to document that somehow. But again, it's static documentation, not live, you know, okay, here's with this, this code, we can produce the exact results you're expecting. So I definitely yeah, see the value there. That's one criticism of um, like Excel specifically is that you end up with a snapshot of the data that somebody spends a lot of time analyzing and then the data changes and then what do you do to update that? You also end up with a bunch of copies or you end up in like a shared repository for that Excel spreadsheet or whatever, but it's separate from where the code of the data might live, right? It, it lives over here, either in like OneDrive or something like that, where everything else lives um, different places. Um, or you're doing like Google Sheets, which is the same problem, right? It's living in the cloud, somebody else's computer over here, but your data source and all of your code might be in a different place. Um, so that's that's my main criticism of that generally is that like, Everybody's like, I need to answer this question, goes off and does their own analysis, which is good. They come up with separate spreadsheets, which is bad because then you have to go and resolve how all those things come together. Um, you can fix that with collaborating, right? You can you can pair program, you can pair Excel just as easy as you can pair program, but then you're still not necessarily getting all the benefits that you could out of it. What else? I like Metabase. I like the ability to share that. It also gives you some visualization. So if there's like recurring question, if there's an ad hoc question that takes different forms, but is fairly recurring, like sharing that as, as a way to um, to share information is good because it's actually running and querying the database and giving you that visualization on the fly. But sometimes it's hard to do the data transformations with that. Um, SQL is really, really good at a lot of things. Not super good at um, at building a bunch of transformations into it in a way that anybody really wants to maintain. <laughs> Anything else? How else do you do you handle that? I like the let someone else do the work. I hadn't considered that one. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put notebooks in here um, because that's become my go-to when I can. Um, my my preference is MetaBase if it's simple. My second approach is Code Notebooks if there's a lot of transformation and I want to show the work along the way. That's really the criteria is. If there's a number of different things or a number of different data sources I need to pull from and then assemble some information from that and show my work, that's what I would otherwise do in Excel, right? I'd create a bunch of sheets, do a bunch of like joins and pivot tables and junk and then say, here's the number at the end. But it's really, really hard. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like a different language or crawling in somebody else's brain trying to go look at somebody else's Excel spreadsheet and what they, what they did. And I don't know why it's so hard, but like everybody does Excel a little bit differently. Um, let's go through a little, little demo of that. 
that notebook. Um, so I, I used the good job lab in part because it already had some tables and I've already run some jobs. And I thought it would be kind of interesting to like, just look at some really basic statistics about those jobs. Um, so this is very similar to the other one to start with, right? We're just executing and loading up the Rails application environment. And then I wanted to show, even though we could get to this through active, um, through, through active record, uh, using the models, I wanted to show that you can actually run SQL queries directly against the database, get data table stuff back, and then do stuff with that. Because um, sometimes it's it's more useful to do that. You can do it the other way. It's easier probably to do it the other way. I just wanted to give a, a I wanted to give an example where you're actually doing something a little bit different. Tim, if I um, can interject real quickly, um, just for those not familiar, we did a uh, meeting on the good job. Um, a uh, replacement for uh, um, what was it? Sidekick. I think we were using Sidekick. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't remember exactly which one we were using, but yeah, one of the anyway, more traditional so, right. go tos. <laughs> so was, we did a, a a meeting on Good Job, and this is that repo now that Tim is talking about adding the Jupyter notebooks to. So, all right, sorry. Yeah, let me, um, so that's a good, that's a good segue into it. Um, what we did with that was we found really inefficient ways of calculating pi. <laughs> and so it, it was hard enough for the computer that we had to spin it off and do an async job. And that was kind of the point was we wanted something that was challenging for the computer to do. Um, so we have a number of test runs of this pi calculation job. Um, and good job has a table for that, right? It has a, a table for all the, what, what class was run um, what queue it was run in, things like that. Um, so what I did was I just went and kind of queried a little bit of that information out of the database. So let's just kind of walk through this because this is probably the most complex code in here, probably, maybe. Um, I have a little like function to just calculate how long something took because it doesn't actually have a duration field. It just tells you when it was finished and performed. Um, so we call that later. I just wanted to kind of put that out of the way from the data. Um, uh, so we could kind of highlight the other pieces better. So we're just getting a connection to the database from our Rails environment and executing some raw SQL. So we're looking at the ID, the job class, the queue name, when it was scheduled, when it was performed and finished. And we want to make sure that it was finished and that it was performed. And the reason for that is we didn't want to have any like weird data out there for durations that didn't make any sense. And I only care about the pi calculation job so that we can actually compare apples to apples here or pi to pi, I guess. Apple pie to apple pie. Um, so we take that result, map it, and symbolize the keys on it. Uh, they're string, key, string keys by default. And then I map over it again in the most efficient way possible <laughs> and merge in the duration, which is just calling that duration calculator on the row that pulls in that duration, right? Um, and then I introduce something kind of new for us here, which is the display method on iRuby. Um, it's a way to say, hey, display this the best way that you can. Um, I don't know that I need it here. I think by default, the last thing that gets returned will also be displayed, but you can do this any number of times and actually see multiple things in your output. Um, and then I created a table out of the array of job hashes. Um, so it basically just takes that and then you can see it presents that in a tabular form so that you can actually look at the results of what was in that query a little bit better than the normal console way of that um, if you don't have like a table formatting gem or something like that. Any questions about that? Any, any ideas, any criticisms of that? This was this was my brain working at about half speed last night when I panicked. What is that, that I iRuby class, Tim? Uh, iRuby is uh, is the way that Jupyter integrates. That's the kernel, I guess you could say, that Jupyter is using to evaluate this code. And iRuby essentially runs the Ruby interpreter. Yeah, because I was thinking of Iron Ruby. Remember back in the day? Yeah, not it's not Iron Ruby or Iron Python or anything like that. I believe it's actually Spy Ruby. Um, well, that's like the I guess that's the organization. Um, I Ruby is within their repository. Um, yeah, so this tells you there's there's a little little bit more about it in other places, but this tells you how to install this iRuby kernel for Jupyter projects. This is what lets us do what we're doing right now. Yeah, so there are, if you look into the, the code base for it, there's a good number of things that it um, that it gives you, but display is one of them. And it lets you um, render markdown, HTML, SVG, PNG, stuff like that. 
kind of the default way of showing information. Any other questions, comments? If you're more familiar with LiveBook, this is like the Kino data table where you just pass in the same kind of data structure and it gives you like sortable columns. I'm not sure if this actually lets you sort. Yeah, I don't know. There's probably a way to do that that's more advanced than I've gotten in it. <laughs> okay, so maybe one thing to note, um, there's now a duration calculation on each one of these jobs, right? And you can kind of see where they land. Um, 35 to 40 seconds, somewhere in there, but there's also an outlier that's going to come back later. Um, all right, so let's say that we actually want to talk about and think about um, the statistics of this, like how long does this job take and how much variation is there in that, right? Um, if you're doing the mean, it's just obviously you sum the things up and divide by that. There's uh, there's something called, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, B-A-R-U um, has data frames and some view things that help us with some uh, data analysis um, for Ruby. And so I think that's maybe what it stands for. Um, and lets you basically like look at data and calculate different things on it. Um, so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm taking the um, this, this piece of information, this mapped out duration that's rounded to whole seconds. And um, I am calculating the mean on that. Um, I shouldn't have rounded it here. I just realized that, but rounding to the tenths of a second. That's why my mean was different in the calculation here versus here. I wondered about that. <laughs> anyway, it's close enough. It's a it's a fairly, fairly good mean. Um, and then I display that. And then we also calculate the um, the variance off of the same data set and display that as well. Now, if you notice, there's actually math notation in here using the LaTeX um, format. So you can actually use like symbols and things like math notation like you would otherwise. If you're doing something that is very math heavy, like I was doing for some of my classes, this is really useful because it lets you use the symbols and the fractional formatting and things like that that everybody wants, wants to see usually. Um, another example of that might be if you need to show four thirds as a fraction, you can do that. Oh, no, you can't do that. I think I need to... Maybe it only wants the single. All of these use a slightly different formatting for it, which is infuriating. Oh, I'm in a code. I'm in code, not in markdown, so that's why it didn't work. Um, here, let's see that. There we go. So you can kind of see it like does math notation, um, math formatting a little bit nicer. Um, you can also do it the same way that I did, where you call iRuby.math, and then you pass in a string that is the same as something you'd want to display to the pen. So it's useful. Um, under very specific circumstances, <laughs> but it is built in, which is nice. All right, um, so let's move on to this. So you can kind of see like we have a mean that's around 35 seconds-ish, and then you have a, like a pretty high variance right here. Um, and we want to see kind of maybe why that is. So if we had like a histogram or something, we could look at to see why that is. Um, that would be useful. So that's what I did. Um, I pulled in high charts. There's a bunch of different plotting libraries. Unfortunately, some of them are pretty out of date, um, stale. It took me, this is the part that took me the longest was actually figuring out a good charting solution for, for data visualization. Um, but I'm just taking the data from, from up here, from the jobs. Um, I'm, I'm doing a, an accumulation. So I had to build my own histogram. That was the thing I didn't like. A lot of the plotting libraries would just let you give it the array of values and it would automatically do this for you. Um, this is the part that was is a little bit messy and try not to read that if you can help it. Um, but it's basically just taking each second as a key and then counting how many times how many times that value was encountered and incrementing based off of that. Um, so then uh, created a little histogram plot um, shown in iRuby that lets you see, um, you know, if you took a whole bunch of these, you'd probably end up something that looks like a kind of a normal distribution around 35-ish, 35, 35, 36. But then you have this outlier way down here that only took four seconds. Um, and so that's why you can kind of almost visually see here why our variance is so high, um, because we were pretty tight grouping in here. And then all of a sudden you get this like one way over on the left. And that was because I think I bypassed the complexity or something like reduce the complexity for that run. Um, so if you're doing some analysis where somebody's like, hey, why does this job time out 
only on Tuesdays at five o'clock or whatever, you can start to look at like what the variance in general is. Um, you do some statistical analysis on it. It's really helpful. This is then shareable, right? You can check this in and say, well, here's, here's, here's what I learned. Um, on Tuesdays at five o'clock, we have this other job that runs that, you know, steals all the resources of the database or something. And you can kind of start to tell that story and put Mark down next to it and, and talk about that. So I found that to be really valuable and some of the things that I've done, um, especially when somebody just wants the quick hits, but you want to be able to show the work if you need to. Um, that tends to be the case more often than it seems like it would. <laughs> All right, we're at 105. I want to make sure that I'm valuing people's time. Um, anybody have any questions about this or any comments, any thoughts about it? Is this is this something that you would find valuable? Oh, well, it's definitely questions? valuable, yeah. I'm going to start using it maybe a lot. <laughs> you said that you uh, used it as a uh, economic uh, MBA student, but I think if as a, as a uh, like IT programming uh, students, uh, it would uh, let them uh, I think a great a type of essays or like uh, works, and also uh, keep uh, like good notes about the uh, courses. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great tool. Absolutely, yeah. I, I did a lot of mine in the uh, the live book side, and there's also support for Mermaid JS, which is like a it's not just charting, but it's like a graphing. So you can show directed graphs, you can show tree structures, uh, a lot of like uh, algorithmic data structure kinds of things that are valuable for us when we're when we're talking about those kinds of things um, has built in support for that. So you can you can basically do that. This has support for GNU plot and some other things as well. So I think you can get there with this as well. I, just, I, I didn't get that far, but yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else have any comments or thoughts or questions? What would you, what other things might you use this on? This is what we'll wrap up with. Um, uh, what are that, ways that, that you think you, you could be? Yeah, that's what you already mentioned. Like, uh, uh, JS is also complex and uh, we miss certain things. Uh, and I, uh, every time Haley takes a break or Katie takes a break and they come back to the project, uh, they ask questions, how do I do this? How, what's this? What, what, what I'm missing? And I think um, now uh, I would write a, a general script, uh, like, not a script, but a, uh, like um, so, something like a script that would uh, uh, restore the that um, like um, local environment. And uh, when we change, like add new lockbox kind of uh, keys or other things, I would update it and they would uh, rerun that. Uh, so uh, if we keep updating it, it will uh, help saving time. It becomes like a giant knowledge base of things. I think at that point you have a management problem where you're trying to like manage the data and how many notebooks you have and how to find it. But that is by far a much better problem to have than nobody knows how anything works <laughs> or it's all stuck up in somebody's head and you have to go find them and hopefully they're available to, to answer your question. <laughs> um, one of the things that I thought would be kind of an interesting way to use it that I've never really explored um, is to document decisions. Um, so there's like the idea of architectural decisions that get made. Um, a lot of times those are made based off of experience and gut, but sometimes they're made off of data. And ideally they're made off of like information that you can consume from your own application experience as well with that with that data set. And so, you know, it's, it's not that much harder to go from here's the data that we found here, here's something to rally around as far as like what we found about that analysis of it like transforming that data into something useful for us to make a decision on to then just turn around and say, and so then this is the decision that we made about this troubleshooting and this problem that we encountered. Um, I just thought that would be like a really cool thing. I feel like that's probably harder to do consistently in practice than, than ideally, but um, that's one of those things that seems like pretty easy to just add that extra little markdown block at the end that says, and this is what we did. <laughs> what else? Anybody else have any ideas for how you might use this? going forward that aren't aren't listed here that we haven't talked about. Uh, as, as I said, uh, I was using a Rails console to write new functions, uh, like one of uh, functions when a user uh, a support team asks one, like small things. I think I will test those uh, like new functions uh, in, in, in this one. Notebook driven development. <laughs> I, 
found my, I find myself doing a lot of mapping with blocks, a ton of like, here's an array of information, mapping through that, transforming it, reducing it. Um, and that's hard to do in the console just because you've got this curly brace, curly braces syntax and you've got a whole bunch of things you might want to chain that through. Um, that's probably more from my experience with Elixir pipelining things. But I think in pipelines now, I think in pipes and like, how do I make this input turn into that output and keep doing that until I get what I want. Um, and that's kind of hard to do in the console. It's easier to see when you when you can flow it into a block and then keep iterating and rerunning that block to get the information the way that you want it. I like that a lot more than just trying to like hit up and you know, mouse or, or key over to the middle of a really, really long line to try to get something or try to do multi-line reproducing. That's the worst. That's the worst case is oh. having to hit up seven times, enter, up seven times, enter. <laughs> Or storing uh, it off in another note <laughs> and then copy and paste it. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, Ula, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, one clar uh, clarification question. Um, so with this, uh, you can access uh, a database, a uh, local database of, on this uh, repo, right? Uh, uh -huh. Yes. Okay, good. And then, uh, like, as I said, I was doing that, in, uh, adding a new rake task and testing mm -hmm. it, a new function. If it can access, then I think it's better. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can access rake, I believe, too. Another thing that you can do, um, I didn't present that, but another thing that you can do is you don't actually have to just connect to your local uh, your local database, right? If you have the underlying library that you're using and it can give you a connection that you can execute SQL against, you can connect to staging or production as needed. Um, I would just caution, don't don't save the credentials in here, right? Like put a put a placeholder in there and have it raise if that variable hasn't been set or something like that. And then that way you can make sure that you're not checking in production credentials in. But you can you can set notebooks up where you where if you have the right credentials and you run them, you can access the production environment as long as you have, you know, the WireGuard or whatever VPN or whatever you need set up to do that. Um, so you can do production troubleshooting from your local machine as well. Yeah, I was more asking about local host. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is this is going to give you like your default dev environment. Cool. Well, I want to I want to be uh, respectful of everyone's time. Um, I hope this was helpful for you. Um, I hope that you get a chance to use it. If you do, I'm really interested in um, learning how you how you use it. What what benefits you got out of it? Um, thanks for joining. Thanks for having us, Tim. See. Thank you, Tim.